we have uh, what some might say a very, maybe the most interesting part of our event. We have a panel discussion. Uh, I think that uh, it, I think we have all the speakers set. Uh, we have uh, pa panelists from all the spheres of localization. We have two people from Microsoft. We have Soren Ebernhardt. We have Diego Bartolome. We have Belen Agulio Garcia from uh, Accessibility War Warriors Freelance. She is the CEO and the main researcher. We have Rina Ribnikova that used to work for Kaspersky Laboratory. Uh, am I saying? Am I am I right? And now Rina is with Positive Technologies. Uh, and Yulia Akulkala, who will be moderating, is with NIMG. Uh, she's a featured author for NIMG. Uh, I think the man should be able to connect just in a minute. Yep, I see. And we are promoting uh, Belen to the speaker. I think we are only waiting for Seren. Yeah, and I see Seren. So our speaker should be all set. There you go, we see land. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Where Hello. are you connected from? Hi, everybody. So uh, yeah, Anna asked us where we are connecting from. So I'm from Russia, obviously, and still in Russia, <laughs> sitting here in the um, tiny cabin in the woods. So if I accidentally drop off, Irina has kindly agreed to take on the moderating from me, <laughs> but let's hope we'll be all here. And then uh, Belen is uh, joining us from the coast of the sea in Spain, right? Yeah, exactly from Alicante specifically. So, so nice to, to be here. <laughs> yeah. And uh, judging by the uh, lightning on this orange uh, background, uh, it's early morning, I suppose, or not? <laughs> it is not that early. Actually, the sun is shining right in my face. Oh, it's, that's uh, sunny. Okay. It's about eight. It's about eight in Seattle on the west coast of the United States. Beautiful town. And Diego is uh, also in Seattle or somewhere else? No, I'm based in, in close to Barcelona. Spain. Great. And Not Irina. As nice as Berlin. No, that's Berlin. Sorry. <laughs> and Irina, of course. So I think you guys. Moscow. Moscow, still Moscow, Russia. <laughs> Irina is in Moscow. And I think you guys are all set and uh, you can take it from here. Uh, I give Yulia all the uh, royalties. You can do everything, <laughs> whatever you want. So I hope you guys enjoy it. Thank you so much. This is great introduction. Very happy to be here. And uh, uh, indeed, we have prepared some uh, intriguing questions. But uh, first things first, probably not everybody here knows who we are, why we are actually allowed to talk, why the gentlemen and Belen and Irina are invited here and were invited by the organizers, Marina Sizova. Thank you very much. Uh, so let's start. I will share my screen and show you just like a couple of slides, and then we will switch back to the speaking heads mode. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so uh, sharing screen, and uh, that should be seen, right? Do you see it? Okay, amazing. So let's hope you do. <laughs> Our plan for today's introductions, uh, then we will discuss some interesting use cases about the technology synergy. And then, of course, we will discuss the uh, challenges of the technology synergy. Uh, so let's start with proper introductions, I, I suppose. And uh, sorry, but ladies first, how about we go with Belen, uh, who uh, is the, oh yeah, Actually, you have here, let me just uh, go to intros. Yes. So you have here the QR codes, which are leading to the LinkedIn profiles of our amazing panelists. And you know what? We won't start with Belen. We will go just one by one. <laughs> so sorry. Sure. Please, please go ahead. Tell us a little bit more about yourself. And thank you very much for joining. Um, thanks for having me. Um, 
So my name is Soren Eberhardt. As you can see, I'm spelled with an O-E there. I'm alternatively also spelled with an O. I'm always saying that it's always a nice introduction uh, into internationalization and localization. Microsoft stole my umlaut. I'm actually spelled with an O with the two dots on top, uh, the German umlaut. I'm originally from Germany, where I started working in localization with a company that worked for Microsoft and made my way then, then to Microsoft itself. Um, so I've been working in localization for over 25 years now, um, 20 years of that at Microsoft uh, in different organizations there. I've been, I've actually localized error messages for Windows myself. Uh, I moved on, I worked on a lot of minority languages or languages with small markets. Um, I worked in Office, Skype and Microsoft acquired Skype. Um, I worked on Microsoft Teams, which I need to advertise because we're on Zoom right now. Um, and now I'm working in marketing localization, which is a little bit a different beast from, from software and support content localization. And I will probably once in a while um, talk about that. I've been also teaching localization at the University of Washington and a few other colleges on and off like CAT tools, but then also localization courses. So I also have a little bit of that academic perspective. Um, yeah, and I wanna keep it short because there are other speakers on the panel as well. Perfect. This is amazing to have such an experienced panelist here today. Uh, thank you. Moving on to Belen. Sure. Thank you so much, Julia. So yeah, I started my career in the localization industry 10 years ago. I started in the game localization industry, specifically in the vendor side. So I uh, or worked in the vendor side in different roles, such as PM, translator, uh, head of uh, translation, head of quality and innovation and designing processes, implementing tools, and so on and so forth for, for my different teams. Then I decided, yeah, I'm tired of working here. So I uh, decided to take a break. And within the, that break, uh, someone from the University of Barcelona contacted me saying, OK, we have a position for a PhD candidate um, in a European project to research how to implement accessibility in virtual reality content. And I said, well, why not? So I uh, took that challenge and I developed my, my PhD um, between 2017 and 2020. Uh, with pandemic and everything. Uh, in the meantime, I was also working with NIMSI Insights uh, now for two years together with, with Julia as well, um, as a researcher specializing in media and game localization in different projects and in different aspects of, of these two verticals. And more recently, be to, to um, do something also new and, and something different. I decided to start a side project, very small project at the moment, but I feel really happy about it because what I want to do with Accessibility Warriors is to help or try to help uh, gaming companies, specifically more the small ones or the ones that don't have the enough resources or knowledge to, to, to make their games accessible and try to help them with consultancy and uh, putting them in contact with end users of accessibility. So people with disabilities who also want to play games and try to work together into creating more inclusive uh, experiences for gaming specifically. And that's what I'm also doing at the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, that's impressive. I'm moving on to Diego. Thank you. So yeah, I'm I'm a senior program manager now at, at Microsoft, working within language and particularly within uh, translation. So translation at Microsoft uh, in our uh, cognitive service team is uh, machine translation. I've been working on on technology uh, for the translation industry since. 2006, I think uh, I created a small machine translation company that we we started uh, creating custom uh, machine translation solutions for translation companies, and we got acquired by Transperfect. Um, and I was there at Transperfect for a few years, setting up the machine translation uh, group, uh, and and we also evolved into other language and machine uh, learning and artificial intelligence technologies. Um, I, as Belen uh, said, I was a little bit tired of that, and then uh, this opportunity at Microsoft came, and I accepted, so I've been here for around six months now, and um, I think there is a lot of potential of technologies to help people, and that's why what I've been working on all these years. 
Thank you very much for sharing. Um, and uh, not to keep our audience waiting, let's quickly move on from Diego to Irina, thanks to whom actually we are also organizing this and I'm, I'm the moderator. So Irina, please, the floor is yours. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Irina Rybnikova. I work for Positive Technologies for now. And I'm a head of department uh, who works with documentation and localization. So both spheres connected and integrated. And I have a great team of 30 professionals right now. So uh, I had more than 20 years of experience in uh, documentation and localization sphere and worked in international companies, IT companies mostly, IT security. So it's kind of Kaspersky Lab, it's Yandex and positive right now. So uh, my favorite topics are building strong teams. I, I, I think it's one of the most important part in our professional life. And another one is technology. So uh, integrating new technologies, trying to integrate everything together into work processes. Uh, that's another favorite part. So that's why I'm really thankful to this conference and to the organizers that the, and to you, my panelist, co-panelist, uh, that you accepted this idea and this discussion because I believe that it's one of the most important topics right now. We can speak about single technologies right now. We can speak only about integrations and um, multiple integrations. So I'm ready to start. <laughs> I'm really excited with it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Irina. Indeed, um, that was Irina's idea to talk about technology synergy. We could probably start with, you know, like the general question, like, what is it? What is this synergy? But um, I suppose that that is the question that we will answer in the course of the discussion in one way or another. And uh, everyone is uh, welcome to sum up for themselves. So to close the round of introductions, I will, uh, of course, not forget myself. So I was invited to, to moderate this discussion because I work in the localization industry since 2010. And uh, my main focus is around language technology. Uh, I don't have a QR code, as you can see, uh, because, well, I'm not the panelist and I'm not supposed to talk much. Instead of a QR code, I will show you the um, one of my favorite products, <laughs> which we do at NIMSI. It's the NIMSI Language Technology Atlas in Landscape View, spe specifically for this event, because it's usually like a vertical. Uh, so this is an indication of how many different tools we have now in the language technology um, only, meaning different kinds of them, uh, some of them uh, that are very familiar to one, um, like from our panelists, uh, that would be, for example, audiovisual translation tools for uh, uh, Belen, then speech recognition also Belen is the main. However, if we <clears throat> uh, think about translation management systems, quality management, that will be definitely Irina. Diego mentioned his interest in machine translation project that he had. And then, of course, with the Soren's experience, I suppose he's familiar with everything that is presented. And of course, if anyone's interested, if anyone in the audience hasn't seen this before, we will be able to, you know, to post the link to the Atlas, etc. Uh, but the Language Technology Atlas is not the point of the discussion. The point, as uh, Irina mentioned, is like, how do we actually connect the dots? How do we, uh, what do we do? How do we push the uh, language technology uh, to the different like, stakeholders at our organizations and what we can do about that. Um, we thought that it may be interesting to actually uh, discuss interesting cases that, and use cases, I mean, uh, that our amazing panelists already have um, witnessed, witnessed in their experience. So, um, for example, if there was some interesting technological synergy in their operations, um, in their respective organizations, um, probably, um, I don't know, Irina, would you want to share an example from your experience? And I will close this so that we turn back to just talking heads. Oh, thank you, Yulia. Uh, you know, when I thought about like, what the real case can I show and can I describe in this uh, discussion, I uh, started to remember what I already did. So of course, uh, I did a lot of um, 
machine translation integrations. Um, for more than 10 years for now, uh, I'm implementing different engines uh, uh, and my team now can train it, can choose it, can uh, they have automatical quality estimation tools in-house in to make quick decisions in some, some different um, situations, for example, for different domains uh, that we are piloting right now. And um, of course, it's integrated into our translation tools and into our development process. Of course, the same way we used, and I always used uh, continuous localization processes that involves all the departments in, in all the companies, developers, uh, translators, uh, technical writers, doesn't matter, there are a lot of them. Uh, and, um, but, but we know all of them for few years, <laughs> maybe many years already, but uh, what's new? And for example, last year we were piloting chatbots and uh, this was a really interesting topic for me because uh, I don't know if you know that the new wave of chatbots are pretty easy to use. Oh, sorry, my cats are playing with something. <laughs> and um, before you needed to build manual trees of questions and answers. And it took, it took a huge amount of work from the people who maintain it. Uh, but for now, if you have like structured uh, database of the texts, for example, we have we have uh, technical documentation and help files, and we are building them, growing them daily. So we have a huge structured uh, amount of texts, and current technologies they allow allow to uh, uh, to analyze it using AI, of course, as everyone, and uh, provide already generated trees. And uh, we piloted one of the engines uh, at the end of the last year, and it was pretty nice. Uh, we, uh, it, it made, made a great tree and we tried different questions and we get answers that we liked. And it even worked with humor. Mm -hmm. So uh, for me, it's another step, it's another technology that we'll try to implement next year. Because I really believe that it's close connected with the document, documents we develop, but it's always connected with support, for example, because you can implement this engine uh, to the website, to like Messenger or anywhere, anyway, anywhere else, and you can uh, reduce the load of your people in support department. Uh, and of course, you can integrate machine translation in it and reach another people and other users who can't reach you before. Because for example, our company, we work with English and Russian as main languages and our support teams work with the, those languages, but we have a lot of clients from Asia, for example, and other district, districts and regions and countries. So that's my opportunity to implement and try it. And I see the clear use case in this case. Uh, it's clear for me, I know what the profit is. Uh, but uh, my question is, uh, I'm with it in all those conferences uh, for all those years, and I see a lot of presentations and descriptions of single technologies, and they're amazing. You all saw NIMS the Atlas, and there are a lot of them. And at the same time, I see a lot of questions from the audience. And the main question is, how? How can I use it? I work in the corporate, I work in like startup, I work in small business, in the store, I'm a freelance translator. People, you are speaking about space. <laughs> How can I implement it in my daily work? So uh, that's the most important question for me still, because I see, still see some spots, white spots for me in this atlas that you mentioned before, because I'm crazy about neuro voices right now. Uh, and this audio visual spot uh, in the saddles. And the same question is for me, how can I use it? How can I try it in my project? How can I help? What, what problems or goals can I help to reach my company or my friends or someone else? So that's my question to you. Are there any of you? challenging uh, use cases, scenarios, how can we use something new? Mm -hmm. 
Great, great uh, intro and nice cases. So uh, multilingual chatbots are uh, indeed a thing and they are not going anywhere anytime soon as far as I understand, uh, and like judging by the trends and the data we have. So maybe uh, gentlemen here have uh, anything on that case to comment uh, or uh, if you prefer, you can straight like uh, go straight to answering Irina's uh, tough question. Uh, and uh, I'm not speaking about neuro voices here because I reserve that slice of a pie to Belen who has a lot to tell us on that. <laughs> Sure. I mean, I'm happy to yeah, okay. to to take the the the, okay. the question and yeah. I mean, one of the of the most exciting things that I, I cannot talk about use cases specifically in my company because we don't use really like uh, language technology in the research that I do. So it's more uh, about researching it and trying to understand the use cases and what we can do with it. But I can talk about the trends that we've identified and how this technology is being used, especially after the pandemic and, and the new use cases that have uh, that evolved, right? So one of the things that, that we've seen specifically about technology that supports multimedia, uh, anything that is multimedia, is uh, it brings a lot of accessibility in, in many senses. So for example, companies were going crazy about finding solutions for automatic subtitles in different languages, multilingual at the same time in so that um, attendees could, could change the languages and so on and so forth. At the time of when we were consulting our clients, there was not a single solution that was offering a proper like high quality uh, technology that offered that uh, real time captions and subtitles in different languages for a video conferencing tool. So that, that's a thing where I think um, technology can really create synergies with video conferencing tools, for example, language technologies, and can increase uh, the, the accessibility to, to me media content to many people. Uh, there are still not a, one single tool, I would say, that are perfectly fit for this use case, but there are companies that are trying to, to fill this gap. Uh, at the same time, there are tools, little tools that are that are in our everyday lives, probably such uh, such as I don't know automatic uh, transcriptions. For example, I don't know if you're familiar with li live captions. It's a plugin that it's installed automatically in Google Chrome, and I've heard from people with hearing impairments that they are, can now go to Twitch, for example, which is a platform for gaming, streaming, and and all sorts of gaming stuff, and they can now actually access the content because before Twitch was not offering accessibility, was not integrating live subtitles and they couldn't access this content in, on Twitch even if they were super interested. So thanks to this little, you know, <laughs> plugin called Live Captions, now people can access this. Um, so, so that's one example. Another example that I use, and now we have Microsoft here, so we can <laughs> promote some of the of the products that you offer. For example, PowerPoint. I don't know if you if you know, but they have these live captions, live subtitles uh, feature, which is completely free. The the speech to text uh, is quite good, uh, even if you don't have a native accent, at, at least it transcribes be more or less okay uh, in English and in Spanish, of course, it can of course be improved because it needs like more punctuation and, and things like that, but it works quite well. And it does automatic uh, machine translation also live. So you can speak in English and then select the subtitles to be uh, machine translated into Russian, for example. Um, the quality of course might not be the perfect, but it's something that, that we can use to enhance linguistic um, accessibility, for example. So these things I'm, I'm very interested in. And to, going back to the questions of Irene about neural voices, and, and this is another topic that we've been listening from many companies. Uh, this, the same has happened with text and machine translation. So, so there's so much text and so little translators in the world to translate all the content that is in the internet. So it's impossible to tackle everything. So the same happens with videos. Now there are so many videos, it's impossible to translate all the video content. So now we have many companies that are creating automated uh, tools or semi-automated tools with human in the loops to create um, also voiceover for the content that is not being properly localized by Dub, dubbing agencies and so on and so forth. And this is something that we've seen a huge in, increase in the in the last year, especially for certain content types such as um, 
e-learning content, for example, where budgets are usually quite tight, or enterprise content, internal communications, trainings, and so on and so forth. So uh, voices are getting better. They don't, don't sound robotic anymore if they are well trained. And we are reaching the uncanny valley moment where we don't know if that's a person or if it's a, a robot or a synthetic voice. So that's something super exciting where technology can be integrated with the workflows of, of the companies as well uh, and provide a wider language accessibility for many people who are craving for video content in, in different languages other than English, please. <laughs> so yeah, that's yeah. my contribution. Well, thank you. Uh, about the uh, live chats for PowerPoint you mentioned and we smiled with Irina because actually we saw in 2019, I think at the Translation Forum Russia conference, Gary Lefman from Cisco, right? Was presenting it and uh, the audience was fascinated so thank you microsoft <laughs> so you know yeah one point about this uh, this case when gary turned it on he didn't tell to anyone that it will happen so interpreters were crazy oh yeah well that, yeah I mean, that, they, that's another they, story they, they uh, listened to the text and tried to interpret it and the same time they saw a translation and yeah. it was not bad you know yeah so uh I, I don't know how their minds worked uh, in this situation, but we had a great feedback right after. They were shocked, surprised, and but, but you know, uh, they uh, both ways, uh, uh, like um, machine translation in this case, and people, uh, they work together. So uh, that, that was really, that really amazing case in th that time. <laughs> Thank you for remembering it. So uh, would uh, Diego yeah, or Soren comment on, on that particular uh, you know, use case or anything else? I want uh, Soren, I can go uh, and, and go a little bit deeper. This, uh, these use cases uh, are great. Uh, and uh, maybe in that uh, uh, conference where uh, interpreters were reading the machine output and probably that, that can cause something in the brain, no? because we are not used to doing those things that two at a time which require a concentration. Uh, but anyway, uh, on, on, on the topics we have discussed, I'm, I'm within uh, cognitive services at Microsoft. And uh, our four pillars are um, speech, language, vision, and decision. And those are, uh, let's say, the core of the technologies we offer uh, in the market. No, those are the models that can be also customized so that you can create your own voices, neural voices. That's a huge success and also helping a lot with accessibility as Belen was saying you can customize your machine translation systems you can customize your speech recognition systems and, and all of them together uh, let's say can help you Irina with your uh, uh, use cases so the, the there is no limit basically with all those technologies you can think about them and and, and create your own solutions that is uh, sometimes not obvious but um we also provide another layer uh, uh, which in which we join several uh, cognitive services together. For instance, one of them is a speech translation where we do speech to text, machine translation, and uh, TTA, te text to speech. Another one, which is uh, probably interesting for this audience as well, is form recognizer. So if you are a, a company having a lot of documents where you have uh, fields and text that you have to recognize, you can apply OCR. And then uh, this, uh, on top of OCR, if those documents are multilingual, then you can apply machine translation. And that's uh, a service that is quite successful as well, especially in uh, companies that have uh, uh, offices all around the world. Um, the similar, similar use cases ex ex exist for language. So today you can create chatbots, as, uh, as Irina was mentioning, that are pretty accurate in language and easy to maintain. But you have also other techniques like extraction of um, uh, name entities, extraction of facts, uh, extraction of relations, and all those things. And we support many languages in those technologies. But if you want then to provide or to have some insights in your own language, you will apply machine translation on, on top of that. So you will have a chain of services that will allow you to solve a business problem. So technologies are amazing, and, and I agree in the field is is uh, changing constantly and, and, and very, very fast. So we need to learn every day because otherwise we trust it very, very fast. But, but the limits are, are endless. So uh, uh, we see uh, some of the applications that I like these days a lot are related 
uh, both the more futuristic ones like Synthesia and all those applications that can generate video automatically. That's quite impressive, uh, but let's see what the applications are. But uh, probably the area where I see a lot of uh, improvement and a lot of productivity that can be achieved and, and really help people is in the call center scenario. So for customer support, for instance, I see a lot of uh, potential use cases there that are not, let's say, properly, properly solved. Thank you. Soren, to add to so, that? Yeah. Yes, um, because um, I, I would like to uh, talk a little bit about the um, where are we using those technologies, right? There's a really great stuff out there. Um, and sometimes feeling that um, the whole supply chain needs to be really involved in that. I just recently saw statistic that 45% of translators, um, have, they are not using MT at all. Um, not as in post editing machine translation. So they're not even using, um, and most CAD tools now have some integration with the uh, existing MT engines that are out there for free. So um, it's not only the clients, um, like Microsoft build really awesome, awesome technology and and then maybe have a chatbot localized. Um, they need to think about the problem. I think it's, it needs to be the whole supply chain to really make sure that we have an integration. Um, so the question is, where can people, where can translators, where can LSPs utilize those technologies best? Um, I feel like translation management, that that upper left corner of the of the NIMSI atlas, um, people are so familiar with that, but even that took some, some time, right? And then the same thing with post-editing machine translation, we think that it's really prevalent in our industry, um, but shockingly, it doesn't seem to be as prevalent <laughs> as, as the people who are using it day in, day out um, might assume. So there's probably some, some work that needs to be done there, um, starting, starting with the individual translators. I hope that um, we have individual translators listening, listening to us and just seeing, um, just make yourself familiar with um, all the technology that is out there. Um, yes, and even including something like, like the OCR that Diego mentioned, right? Um, instead of typing in a text, uh, can you can you easily scan it and have it um, have it recognized? Um, there's so much technology out there now, and I know that um, especially the CAT tools providers they are looking into a lot of that. But uh, there's I think there's also a lot of space for improvement there. The text to speech um, can people just sit there and dictate? their translations, right? And then having um, the text input input that way. So um, I think there's a, there's a lot in that area. And then one aspect that I wanted to mention as well is that obviously our industry is the one that is um, delivering all the, all the data for improvements in many of the areas that Diego mentioned, right? Um, at least for, for language um, degree as, as well, the decision. Um, so there's, um, Kind of a lot of the the first MT systems actually relied on the translation memories that um, language service providers created to have that bilingual content. So we should also look at that. You know, we have all these assets. What can we do with them? What can can we do with the data that we already have and um, utilize utilize um, our own our own material um, to to take benefit of those of those technologies. Thank you. Actually, about uh, utilizing something that we already have, I uh, suspect that uh, Irina's case, which she presented with her colleague a couple of years ago at another conference uh, about content reuse, that is something also very uh, interesting. We might as well want to mention it here quickly, if it's okay with Irina, uh, because it's you know it's a subject that uh, is kind of connected with the localization in a way, uh, even though it's more uh, like coming originally from the technical documentation, but still the benefits for the localization are obvious. So if you want to spread the word about that, Irina, I think it, it might be even interesting for the gentleman here. So. Oh yeah, just a few words about it because content reuse is like basic technology for uh, documentation sphere right now. Or, uh, all the professionals work in content management systems and then they based on this technology. But the new case for us was that we implemented 
uh, interface strings in it. So uh, that's what we wanted to try that time. And uh, we, uh, I can tell that we implemented it in all the projects, but uh, that was a real interesting experiment to uh, integrate uh, resource strings into the documentation strings. I mean, connect them together. But content reuse, of course, that it helps you to write some ideas, some text once, translate it once, proofread it once, and then use it everywhere where, where you need it, like puzzles. So uh, um, I can, <laughs> you know, maybe I can't remember about it. I, I, don't, I didn't mention it because it's my basic right now. So we always use it in daily life, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Uh, personally, I was fascinated with that example when I first heard about it uh, because of exactly the, you know, like the uh, concept of reuse and recycle, which is also very dear to me in the like, general case, not only with regards to the data and content. So um, uh, actually, you mentioned here the very vital point that the majority of like the uh, uh, companies now work in the CMS if they have any content. And uh, CMS content management systems are having some troubles currently connecting with TMS translation management systems. However, as compared to a couple of years ago, for example, we now have uh, like, I think, uh, moved uh, a little bit further in this uh, connection uh, and um, uh, we also even witnessed the emerge of companies uh, that are specialized in exactly connecting the dots in uh, providing connectors from a CMS to a TMS, for example. That would be some middleware companies uh, or companies that actually build connectors for you. Um, so we can name, if, if uh, someone from the audience is not uh, like familiar, we can name Be Lazy here, for example, this company, um, and who is like special, specialized in integrations per se and creating them. And this speaks very well to the topic of technology synergy. But I also see Soren Mike is on, so maybe he has something to add about that. <laughs> yes, yeah, I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, a lot of the tools. So I think that the integration be between TMS and CMS is super important. Um, but I think that one of the areas where we can also improve is making CMS as more localization friendly. Just um, a lot of those systems are basically, they're assuming that things will be in one language, right? It's not that you can have even two source languages, for example, um, or pivot language in between, or uh, just that flexibility of having different assets, um, like visual assets, for example, if you have web pages in your SM CMS, um, that you can just switch out, switch out images instead of thinking that um, images will always be used worldwide. So I think there's a lot of um, room for improvement in some of the content generating systems. So Irina, I, I think that's fascinating that you worked on that side already, that integration of um, by correct, correctly understood um, UI strings within documentation, um, having that uh, regulated and CMSs have, um, there is like controlled language, there are all these, these approaches, but I think that um, that's an area that um, especially when it comes to multimedia creation is even more important to think about how can we integrate the de demands, the requirements of, of localization very early on instead of um, looking at what are the downstream systems doing with that. Totally agree. It's it still cause some problems. For example, we use uh, CMS that we use is schema ST4 or schema ST4. Uh, in German, so it has a great uh, localization model inside, but uh, we, of course, we translate it and we localize all the text uh, using like export and import and using CAD tools. And uh, there are still problems with connecting on, on the glossary level, for example, uh, because I, I want to use one glossary, one source uh, for the glossary and implement it in any tools. And it's still the problem, you know, we discussed it once and uh, even if you have a huge uh, professional tool, the integration is still a problem. And that's why we need some external experts or we need, for example, in my case, we work with close connection, the same like bigger department that my, than mine with DevOps team. 
system analytics, UI designers, uh, UI developers, UX designers, and even machine learning. So we are close friends and we can, um, oh, excuse me. Excuse me, I was like uh, paused somehow. And um, oh, we are close friends and they help me with some integrations and with some, um, I don't know, IPI, con IPI connection, connections. So it helps. It helps when you have someone near who can help you with automation and others. Indeed. Well, uh, but if you, if you don't, then... Uh... It might be like a uh, reason to look out for uh, the third parties who, right, who, who do these integrations. However, I'm not saying they are almighty and they will solve the uh, challenge because exactly as Soren mentioned, not every system is designed to be integrated. And uh, uh, if like uh, thinking about it, we can also probably uh, say that we can know or speculate on some reasons for that because not every technology company wants you know to be super open uh, for example let's say from the tms cohort uh, there is one company uh, that is very strict about any any connections they are trying to you know, like provide all the functionalities inside of their system not not uh, agreeing to integrate with uh, whatever other system. So that also happens. And uh, indeed it uh, also well, can be, um, uh, well, can be reasonable in some cases. So I don't think we're moving to like all things connected uh, space. Uh, however, some would disagree. For example, we have the campaign connected translation, right? Which is uh, uh, already circulating for a couple of years from SmartCat, I think. Uh, who actually organizes the um, uh, major conference with three thousand participants tomorrow? It's free, lock from home. Probably some of you speak there, and <laughs> so uh, I think I saw yes, yeah, some some of you were in the speaker list. However, um, what uh, do you think about this connected translation? Um, like maybe for the near future, do you uh, foresee Diego, Sorin, or Belen? Uh, if uh, you know if this is even achievable, uh, and when? If so. I, can go ahead. Uh, I think it's tricky as you were saying it's a, it's also a matter of uh, who controls you know the the overall eco ecosystem and and that can be tricky uh, I, I really think though that um, uh, systems should be uh, accessible uh, and that meaning they should be able to uh, be connected and connect to other systems right and uh, and that's where interoperability comes into play and that's when uh, we can be created uh, creative about solutions that on the one side, but on the other side, I also think that it's very, very important that some of these features like uh, machine translation or uh, quality assurance or quality estimation or whatever technology we integrate, they are all a, a feature in a platform. So we should be able to, as a user or as a corporate buyer, we should be able to use just one system. We don't want to use thousands of systems and, uh, and then get connected to all of them and make things uh, over, uh, uh, very complex because everyone wants to control their own piece, right? So, and getting those pieces together and creating a good overall end-to-end -end solution, probably it's related to what Soren was mentioning before. So CMS, we should probably start there and make that multilingual uh, uh, as the core. And then everything else should be uh, should be inside to an extent. Of course, it's not that easy and it's tricky. And uh, of course, there are a lot of companies doing uh, a lot of the pieces. But in in, in a way, uh, users need to have uh, an easy experience and a seamless experience, which very often we we don't. Uh, and providers uh, in the, in that chain also, right? It's tricky for translators to connect to many systems. It's tricky for uh, translation companies to have connectors to I don't know how many systems and uh, that, uh, that that creates inefficiencies that to an extent uh, we need to find creative ways to to solve probably. Thank you for your comment on that uh, and I know that Belen wanted to talk about integrations in the media industry. 
Yes, because we're talking mainly like tech, text-based um, type of uh, management, but when you go to the multimedia space, everything is completely different. And there's so, I would talk about lack of synergies more than more than synergies, unfortunately, because not only because the, the content is more challenging because it's, it's video, it's audio, and it's so many different layers. So it's a polysemiotic um, kind of content, but at the same time, the technology, the, the traditionally this industry, especially for subtitling and dubbing, they haven't been heavy users of language technology. Of course, for subtitles, yes, because you need a subtitling editor, but for dubbing, not at all. So the usage of TMS is not a standardized in the media industry, and I'm talking specifically about like more creative part. I know media entails much more, but talking about Netflixes and Disney's and things like that, TMS is not something that is integrated in the workflows, they work in different ways. And one thing that is creating lots of friction now in the industry and all the translators are complaining and they are completely right, is that some companies are trying to force machine translation into these workflows without properly setting this up and you know testing it and so on and so forth. And that's creating lots of friction and lack of synergies and people are being super like, we don't want to use technology because this is like going to, to make us miserable and this is not working and so on and so forth. So sometimes when you are trying to force the use of language technology in a use case that is not working or that needs a little bit more of time or maturity and specifically putting the user in the center of it to make it efficient. So if the user of this language technology is translator it's, it's a translator, then you have to think about what are the needs. And of course, it needs to be aligned with the business model that you have and so on and so forth. But forcing certain technology uh, into certain workflows sometimes is a bad idea. So that I just wanted to share that. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing that. Uh, I don't know, uh, maybe uh, Sorin uh, would add to that with regards to his own experience and why I'm like pointing at Soren uh, because some things that you said just now Belen uh, we have been uh, seeing for years with the many adoptions of new technologies and Soren is one of like the most experienced people here so probably he would have some comment on that. Um, yes, I mean, regarding the, the post editing of machine translation um, that Belen was just talking about um, Yes, we've we've seen that resistance. And there is actually some interesting interesting studies about um, machine translating making people faster and increasing the quality. Um, but on the other hand, subjectively, translators would say, um, "I don't get the quality that I want, um, and I don't like working with it." So surveys have shown that. And um, in in my own work, I was working on the language quality strategy for for Skype for a while. Um, we would see that actually some some translators really liked working with um, machine translation as the basis of of their work, um, and some people just hated it and they would give us feedback. Um, and even today, when somebody finds a bad translation, uh, user feedback still today is this looks like machine translation. So, uh, which is not really flattering. Sorry, Diego. Um, it's not really flattering for machine translation, right? That that is kind of the the equivalent in in people's mind. A bad translation is assumed to be machine translation, um, and we see that um, very often it's not true. It's the blunder of a, of a human translator that they're complaining about. So, um, but this resistance, um, and I was talking about the translator is one important part, right? We can talk a lot about integration, but if translators have that resistance. Um, we should be aware of the fact that post editing machine translation is a different skill from from translating from scratch um, and it differs by by language pair uh, that people are working on kind of the, the quality of the machine translation might differ. Um, but it's definitely a, a specific skill even. Um, the transition to translation memories was hard for people and I was kind of involved in the in the later phase of that, but I could see that people were still um, a little well. Some of them put up resistance of working off a fuzzy match. For now, to, today, everybody in the industry is so used to doing that. Um, but we have that kind of that same phenomenon now with um, post editing, and especially in areas where people have to be more creative, right? They need to develop that that skill. And I think it's part of um, everybody in the industry of the of our work also to to make sure that 
that transition happens with the with the translators. Um, in in academia, people need to be trained more uh, for that and also be more prepared because. Uh, a lot of translators, when they're going to a school teaching translation, they still learn. They basically that is their cat tool, right? A piece of paper, and they will will write down things. And that is not how how you work in the industry anymore. Um, but they they then have to get used to cat tools, and then they eventually get confronted with machine translation as something that they have to work with day mm -hmm. in day out. Thank you. Well, before I uh, switch to Irina, because I saw she wanted to comment on that, um, a quick example on MT and technology synergy. Yesterday, MT machine translation, right? So yesterday, mm, there was the big announcement uh, of Airbnb um, and their new way of doing machine translation for all their content via a specifically tailored towards their goals, the uh, technology provided by their partners, translation company, which is called Translated. And uh, Translated has like different technology products and projects around MT and uh, TMS, like several way, um, variants of TMS. But uh, the point is that this is, in my opinion, I'm happy to be proven wrong, but in my opinion, this is exactly an example of technology synergy because the Airbnb has their own stack, like, you know, the translated had to come up with a, uh, like, special technology solution. They work together. Uh, uh, the Salvo from Airbnb told us yesterday that uh, they meet together every, t every day which means that, hey, on the on one hand, we have the client, on the other hand, we have a technology company who also does like the service, the liquidation service. And uh, altogether, they have created this new uh, new product, which, uh, you know, is allowing for localizing how they put it, the gazillion of words yearly. So uh, that is an example of synergy. I haven't tried it. I mean, I haven't seen it, but by the, by the looks of it, it should be interesting. So, um, this is mentioned by me now because I also heard this thought yesterday that the empty machine translation now is like the default for many, uh, you know, like companies, big players, uh, especially in like technology sphere as well. So uh, I second Soren's opinion about what we can do to improve the post editing experience and the post editing knowledge. Uh, so that, that's the comment I wanted to make on that. And uh, Irina, sorry, you wanted to also add something uh, in this regard, right? Because you muted yourself. I mean, not about Airbnb, but the topic that Soren has raised. Whoops. Yes, uh, you know, uh, I think uh, I don't have an answer. Will we solve this problem of integration or not? I'm just waiting because uh, every time I'm consulting a new company, I see the same question. Maybe we'll develop someone something by ourselves, like new cattle, like new something. Doesn't matter. So every every developer starts with this question, and uh, it doesn't matter how many already existed. <laughs> so I think we'll just multiply ideas of integrations and requests for integrations. And, and you know, for example, in Russia, huge companies uh, they develop tools just because they need to develop something separate. Uh, they don't want to depend on uh, some cloud solutions uh, that are provided from different parts of the world. Uh, parts of the world. So uh, they just need to do it. So it's, it could be like just an idea of someone who wants to practice in new development, or it could be a real necessity to do something new and separate. So the world is too huge. I, 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 I don't know. I don't know. Maybe in future, in the future, something happened with the whole total integration, but not sure. But you know, can I ask one more question? Um, I know that there are a lot of students here listening uh, today, and uh, we are talking about such hard technologies, so many numbers of like technologies. But uh, uh, how do you think? Is it hard to? understand what's going on. For example, if you're a student and you, you start to uh, do localization and you want to grow in technology direction. So uh, is it possible or how long can it takes you to understand how it's connected, how it can work together or 
uh, something like this. Well, I can just chime in a little bit since I have a academic background and we also work with lots of students. So I would say one important thing is to follow all the news technology related on a specific uh, news outlets such as NIMSI, Multilingual, Slater, and all these companies. We I can share links if, if you want. So just keep up, uh, sign up for the newsletter if it's possible in Russia, sorry, because I'm not aware which things can be accessed and which cannot be accessed. Um, also, all, all, all different associations that provide this type of information, it's important. Uh, trying to network, trying to talk to people who understand how this works, attending this type of, 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 uh, of events. But of course it's not easy. And I mean, I've been in this industry 10 years and I'm just now finding new things every day. So I don't think it's uh, attainable to be able to understand everything, but at least the basic things. I think the, the, the most important thing is yes, to try to understand the use cases, try to you know gain some empathy and, and like some how put you, yourself in the shoes or the others and try to understand which the challenges might be and then develop this mindset of okay, how can you know uh, connect the dots and trying to, 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 to make this work? Why is this person in this company wanting to do this? It makes no sense from my translator perspective. But then if you are a project manager, then maybe it makes sense. So try to talk to as many people as possible, follow the, the main news outlets on this industry social media and so on and so forth and yeah just be patient because there's so much out there <laughs> thanks uh can we consider this question more or less covered because uh, i would love to hear the insights from the technology providers here who would be the and soren about the uh like if any one of you actually can answer that what we as the localization specialists can do to have better technology synergies is in addition to what Soren mentioned about, you know, like thinking uh, over, T over CMS uh, from the modeling perspective. Diego, please, you unmuted yourself. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, probably it's a, it's a question of playing, no? We just should play, test things, uh, break things, and, um, and try to achieve with the technologies that are out there what, uh, as Irina was mentioning at the beginning, try to apply those technologies together to solve a problem that we might have. And that involves playing, uh, making mistakes, learning, and then keep on improving every day. Cool. Anything to add, Soren? <laughs> um, no, I, I would like to reiterate that. I think that people often think about the, the really big picture. And I, I think that um, getting that information of where things are going, even all those pie in the sky projects that are really abstract, um, that might be interesting. But uh, find those use cases, as Diego said. Like you, you don't learn better than by by breaking things. Um, just try some integrated machine translation in a CAT tool if you're a translator, and see how what that does. Um, just have a sample project for that. I think that's always how the people learn best um, about technology when they're trying to use it. Thank you. Uh, so, Irina, uh, how how do you feel about that? Uh, are you more or less satisfied with the insights and uh, you know answers we shared today discussing technology synergy, or do you crave for more? <laughs> you know, I'm more than excited. I really like all the ideas that were covered here, and uh, you know, uh, I believe that every like uh, listener today or every visitor of this conference can ask ourselves. I mean, every professional they see a speaker here, they ask them directly because usually we are all in LinkedIn or other social media and we are ready to like help sometimes. Sometimes we have, we have time for it. <laughs> and uh, some of them do mentoring. So if you wanna grow in this industry, you can, you can contact uh, professionals, experts, and uh, maybe it will be this, the beginning of the professional path for you. Thank you. That's amazing. So I've put on the uh, QR code uh, slide again. I hope you can see it. Uh, just hover on it with you know your device if you have uh, it um, at you. And uh, yeah, uh, also uh, feel free to reach out to us, of course, individually. Uh, with that, I think we're like managed to have a very interesting conversation for an hour. 
I would probably uh, have myself some comments on continuous solutions, you know, like multilingual chatbots, et cetera, et cetera, but time's up. So I am inviting our uh, like host, Anna and Marina maybe uh, to, uh, <laughs> to take over. And uh, I would like to very, very, very much thank you every panelist of today's technology synergy discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julia, for the invite. <laughs> yes, thank you. yes, indeed, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you guys so much for joining us today. It was really insightful. Julia vanished. Uh, uh, I wanted to thank you, our panelists, for connecting with us. It was really nice. And we also have a question in this Q&A section. All the speaker mentioned new technology appearing in five years. What is your guess? What skills are worth to invest to, into? Uh, I think uh, it's a very interesting question. So what do you think new aspiring freelance translators, localized localization experts should learn how to do to stay relevant in five years? I think we partially covered that with the lens reply, but maybe someone else, and actually Rina's, but someone else maybe wants to add to that. Not really. <laughs> well, I would I would just say stay stay on top of what's happening in the um, space of of cat tools, what's developing there, because um, they are they're evolving quickly. Um, and yeah, if you're a translator, if you haven't done so, familiarize yourself with post editing machine translation. Um, and well, also look at those areas of, of translation technology that are less influenced by TMS, as, as um, Milena mentioned, for example, um, what's happening with in subtitling, um, what's happening in trans creation, because there are some areas. Um, where there's probably less of a strict process as it's established in other areas of the of the industry, um, but changes are happening there as well. So um, I would look at those areas um, just to just to see how they are being impacted by changed trans, uh, language language technology. For, for, thank you for subtitles. Actually, an amazing change we've seen recently is that there is an example of technology synergy because before, like exactly like let's say five years ago, we weren't able to have the video on which we are localizing subtitles for which we are translating inside a TMS, inside our translation environment, our translation management system. However, currently there are already several TMS that provide that access and uh, they are also increasing the in-context review area where you would actually see uh, like real time how the document you're working on if this is not a subtitle or a video or just a document maybe uh, how it is changing once you know like you apply the translation so this is called in context review in case someone just doesn't know that uh, and uh, this is also uh, already available in a couple of tms uh, systems and i suppose that this is really a good example of technology synergy because before it was much uh, more like, you know, uh, sophisticated to have, you know, like multiple screens uh, and trying to navigate between them. And then in the process, you could eventually lose the, the actual desire to do the job. So at least from my experience. Yeah, I think we all can relate to- I can, I can add maybe uh, the idea that I see uh, in common world that the new virtual reality is close I mean, uh, like Meta and other products and companies that started, they are planning to do more in the virtual reality. And I believe that multi-language communications will be there too. So uh, somehow, uh, but no idea is how it will be solved right now. <laughs> so it's just something, next steps. Fascinating, we'll sit and see. Yeah really valuable insights all you guys have. And also I wanted to mention for those of you who are connecting from Pedagorsk who have uh, several languages that they call their native languages, Microsoft um, just recently uh, finished developing an MT translation for a lot of rare Russian languages. 
we are really excited to hear this news because, you know, just a month ago, our client was asking us, do you use machine translation for this language pair? And we were really confused. Like there is no machine translation available. And a month later, Microsoft does this. It is commercially available. So I think that a lot of you guys may consider being experts in these languages. We previously thought that, uh, you know, Russian, these big uh, languages, and now a lot of smaller languages are getting the friction and a lot of need in localization industry, which I see at least is for these small languages. And it's really hard to find a really good localization expert and a tech expert in this area. So that's what I wanted to add. I'm, I was really excited to learn about it. And uh, also was really excited to have you guys today. Diego is, Diego vanished. I think it's, it must be really, uh, it must be night there in Barcelona where he's connecting from. So, uh, Good morning to Saran <laughs> and uh, good night to you ladies. You were a joy to have our, our audience here in the location. We're all really excited to hear your thoughts. So we are really excited about your panel discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, for us. So we, I think, so thank you. Thank you so much for inviting us. Thank you, Rina. We were really excited to finally have you. Also, Irina is the ambassador of Lock Lunch Moscow. And I think tomorrow is our Lock Lunch Russia. No, so. On Friday, on Friday, 2.30 uh, Moscow time. Share the link. You yeah. can share the link and invite some people. Okay, okay, okay. We'll be really happy to join you. I heard lots of good things about Irina as a host. So it will be my first time joining there will be three ambassadors this time, uh, Moscow, Piatigorsk, and St. Petersburg. So yeah, welcome. So see you there, I guess. See you. Thank you. Thank you all for tuning in. Thank you all for being a part of Piatigorsk Translation Club. It was our first online event. It um, was so exciting to finally branch it out. Uh, it was really personal to me because it was the event that introduced me to localization. And I hope that some of you guys may say that about Better Growth Translation Club, especially this session, some years ago, uh, some years, when some years passed. So uh, yeah, I hope that we today may introduce some future, you know, next Mark Zuckerberg of localization. Imagine saying that five years from now. Yeah, I, they were, first introduced to the industry by the Pedagogy Translation Club. I hope that this becomes a really nice tradition that we all share. And uh, I hope that next time we will be able to share even more exciting international speakers and local experts, especially with you. I was really happy to be a host today and I was really happy to see all the new and familiar faces show up. And I think we are wrapping it up if you still have some questions, you can use any other social media. We have Instagram, we have VK, uh, we have LinkedIn for our international uh, friends. And uh, we will be updating the website and our social media with the valuable insights from our speakers. So I hope you stay tuned for that. And uh, I hope I see you at next Pedagogy Session Club. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, see you later, guys.